Someone pass me a drum and I'll start the story. So there was a time when the whole community was tied together with stories. They were still true in Ireland a hundred years ago. All the family gathers at night and the storyteller comes in. And they talk about it for a week. No one knows where these stories come from. But it's very likely that there were tremendous psychologists in the world before Freud and Jung. And they couldn't write any books because there weren't any books. And if they did put it in a book, then some Serb, I almost said that's not right, some macho would come and burn it anyway. So the best thing to do is take what you know and put it into a story. And you had to make the images so vivid that people would remember all the details for 500 years. And that was the way Christ chose to teach, as you know. A little parable so fantastically detailed that no one forgot. So the stories were carried all over the world. There are stories in Norway that are identical to stories in India, only with different names. So that's very mysterious how all that went. This is a story that turned up in Germany in the late 19th century, God knows where it came from. It's very clear by one word that it'll turn up that it's a Mediterranean story. So we are leaving our time now. There's no, Martin mentioned an idea once, you know, you make bark in a tree by bringing the inward outward. So that's the job all of us have, to go inside and find what's inward and tender, and then bring it out until the world gets used to it. And then you got some bark. There's still more inward stuff inside, so... So this is somebody's inwardness that's been brought out until it's bark. So we honor the four directions, east, west, north, south. We also honor the fifth direction, the vertical one going straight down, which is here with us today. Now, you must know that at one time, there was a father and a son. And the father was a woodcutter. And he worked very hard. And his son was getting to be 15, 16. And he said to his son, I'm going to chop as many hours a day as I can, 12 to 15, because I want you to go to college. So I've already saved some money for you, and here's the money, and you go off, and you go to college. And the son said, thank you, I will. But I don't know what happened. Maybe the father got uh, rheumatism in a couple of years. Whatever, maybe people died and stopped buying the wood. For whatever reason, the father got very broke. And he had to write to the son to college and say, I think you better come home. Because otherwise, your mother and I are not going to make it. So the son came back from college. And the father gave him an axe. No, the father said, well, here we are. And the son said, I'll go out and help you cut today. The father said, we only have one axe. You know, we're a poor family. Well, I still want to help you. The father said, all right, I'll go to the neighbors and I'll borrow an axe. So he went to the neighbors and he borrowed an axe. And he brought it back. Two of them set out in the forest. So they chopped all morning. When it was lunchtime, they had a couple of sandwiches. And father said, sit down now. Let's lie down and take a little rest. Oh, I don't know, the son said. I don't know. I think I'll just wander around and see if I can find any birds' nests. Uh, it's clear he's an adolescent, isn't it? Father gives him good advice. He says, no, 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 no. So he wanders off and he wanders through the woods. Oh, God, birds, aren't they wonderful? And keeps following. There's a different one, there's a new one. And finally he walks through the woods and he comes upon something, an angry-looking oak tree. He notices a very angry-looking oak tree. So he walks up to this tree. You know how you're drawn by certain trees and things that look a little different. 
comes up to the tree and he hears this little voice. Let me out! Let me out! So he looks. He can't see anything in the trunk. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! And it seems to be coming from down in the root somewhere. Let me out! Let me out! So he brushes away some leaves and sh down there in a little hollow of the leaf. Let me out! Let me out! Come on! Let me out! Let me out! And there's a little glass bottle there. <laughs> Takes off this glass bottle, holds it up to the light, and there's a little spirit in it. It looks like a frog. Like a little frog. Let me out! Let me out! Come on! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! What would you do? <laughs> hmm? You let him out? Yeah. Well, what a winner. I'm an adolescent. Nothing bad can happen to me. <laughs> I'm invincible. I'm right. Immortal. I'm immortal. I'm right. Omniscient. So. Yeah, stupid. Stupid. Right. <laughs> Pulls out the cork, and immediately this little green thing. <laughs> I'm having this thing at two miles high. Ah, good, I'm out, I'm out. Now I'm going to give you your reward, you little son of a bitch. You're going to break your fucking neck. Ah! <laughs> and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm the one that let you out. Don't cripple about details. <laughs> I've been in there a long time. You think people put me in there because they want to be kind to me? <laughs> Is that your idea? Well, you let me out and you're going to have your reward, which is, I'm going to break your neck. So lie down. Well, hmm. <laughs> the problem, hmm? Tell the story you're going to get right now. <laughs> now, there's one detail I have to give you. <laughs> One detail. The spirit says, I am the great god, Mercurius. That's to say there's Mercury. With the Greeks, it's Hermes. And as we said last night, with the Native Americans, it's Trickster, Raven, and Coyote. The difference is the word mercurius is the word that's used all over uh, alchemy. You know, mercury will dissolve all other metals, etc., etc. So they began to regard mercury as something unbelievable. And it's also the planet mercury. Mm -hmm. Go to an astrologer today and they'll you know, say, well, your mercury is very good this month, so this is a good time for you to write, etc., etc. So this stuff is very much alive and still with us. So that's an incredible detail that... Uh, this God says, I am the God Mercurius, and someone has put me in this bottle. And I made a vow that whoever let me out, I would kill him. So we have to stop there and just think about what that means. What are you going to do with that whole thing? How are you going to relate this whole section to your own life? All right, who wants to jump in? Well, yeah, definitely, because uh, because uh, Mercury is the one that uh, keeps all communication going. Uh, someone like uh, uh, Letterman is pure Mercury. Uh, he's toxic, too. Um, <laughs> but you understand that quick-moving stuff. That's what Mercury is connected with. You can put a bottle and a little bit of it down, it goes everywhere. And Letterman's like that. Jay Leno, all the comics are Mercury people. And uh, Clinton is a Mercury person, too, in his own way. You know, how quickly he moves and switches and changes and... I don't know. <laughs> Molten lead. Anyway. But all communication is connected with Mercury. There's no question about that. All kinds of communication. Even Rush Limbaugh's stuff. And all of the television is all Mercury in a certain way. And the problem with television is that once Mercury gets in there, there's no content at all. Right? Because just the talking is enough. I don't know what I'm saying. But, so, um, so the question is, for some of you in the story, I know a lot of you are used to listening to stories like this, and for others of you, you know, it, it seems a little bit different and foreign. Um, but to what happens is, very often in telling the story, 
whatever is last said is what gets discussed the most very often. And so just put your mind in reverse for just a moment and go back to the beginning of the story and then move forward through the story and see which point of the story so far caused you to go, hmm, that's, ah, that's me looking for the what are you thinking? nest. When the boy walks away from his father, he encounters a situation that's a mirror of himself. And he is, Jeannie's him. And when he allows the mercurial aspect of adolescence to um, drive him, then it destroys everything else, the wisdom and the foolishness, uh -huh. um, which allows him to find a new part of himself. Now, let me object a little bit to his language. Do you hear what he's doing? He said, when you take the mercurial aspect of yourself and allow it to dominate in your adolescence, it does such and so and such and so. That's okay, but that's psychological language. And it makes it sound okay. The point of the story language is that it isn't okay. And uh, you might not live through this uh, in, in long enough to see your psychiatrist. <laughs> so, uh, so we just want to say that what you said was true, and yet it came into a calming down language. Yeah. I regret that when, as an adolescent, perhaps now, uh, I let the genie out of the bottle. Uh -huh. I don't have teachings of a father. Yeah. Help me know how I See, he's getting into the story there now. I didn't have a... He, the, the boy left his father. That's a very important detail. At lunchtime, he went off. And did he do anything wrong? No, I don't think so. But we know that the advice of the father is not going to come this far for various reasons. So you're going to let the genie out of the bottle. Was that too soon or what? Why was that a, a, a problem with you? I regret that I didn't have a that would have led me up to this day. I had nobody to, to, to teach me how to handle uh, problems like that. Yep, and problems like what? The traps that I let myself into. Give us an example of one of them. Marrying a woman fresh out of college when I wasn't ready to marry. Yeah, I heard you. Did you hear that? Marrying a woman who right out of college without knowing what I was doing, having children right away. A good mentor could have said, well, 35 is about the first time to have a child. It's way wild. Or whatever. How to deal with that? Uh, How to deal with what? Debt. Yeah, with debt. Yes, please. This may not relate at all, but what I see in the story so far, the father who doesn't recognize the very important value of the son's education that brings him back home, wants him to be productive with him, but doesn't understand the importance of buying a second back. Right. So the son can't right. That's good. Four hours, asking to take a nap right in the middle of the day. On the other hand, I see a son who tries to break away from it, get an education, but the father is the one that sent the son off for the right. education. Not take, not take the nap. Go out and use the uh, break time as it is. Yeah. Uh, a little exploration, a little uh, adventure. Bird a nest little, watching. Uh, I see him. He has the courage to uh, follow the sound. Yeah. And that way he's curious. And, uh, and has the courage to pop the cork. Now, I don't know what, he's, what, he's, what the results of all that are going to be. But yeah. We get to find that out. Frank, what are you thinking? I keep hearing every story. Every movie I go to, every review I write, I see everything from the father's perspective rather than the son's perspective. And I'm thinking of this father who failed to be able to educate his son sufficiently, had to bring him back home. And Can you all hear him? No. Stand up Stand then, Frank. Uh, maybe it's because I'm 60, maybe it's because I'm a grandfather, but I, I see everything from the father's perspective rather than the son's perspective. I just keep thinking about this father who has spent all of his life with one goal, which was to send the kid to college. And he fails at it. For whatever reason, he fails at it. And he has to bring the boy home. And he has to borrow an axe. He doesn't even have an axe for the boy. Uh, the shame of the father for not being able to tell the son everything the son needs to know. And the main thing the son needs to know is don't open the fucking bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and the father knows that. And the father's too ashamed to tell the son what the son needs to know. Mm. 
The sun is always stupid. All sons must die. But the tragedy of the father, who knows something, uh -huh. But he's too ashamed to tell the son. But the father doesn't honor his own stuff enough to get another act so he can share what he does know with his son. He's too ashamed. He's fake. Right. Yeah. But also, you see, he spent all the money for the college. Right. So you can't get on him too much for not having another act. But he knows something he's not telling the son. He knows to tell the son. The son would do it anyway, but the father would feel better about it <laughs> yeah. if he told the son. <laughs> what are you thinking? And then you... <laughs> Where I connect with this story is it's a return to his own nature. When you're cutting wood, you're using wood for another means. And what the son does in going out into the woods is he hears a voice. It's his own voice. And he finds it in nature, in the woods, in the tree, in the heart of the tree. He opens it up and it becomes life threatening. Uh huh. Okay, but we got to watch again, you know, because after 50 years of psychology, it's very easy to call everything your own voice. And this story will not allow that. And the, 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 the being in the, in the book, in the thing, says very clearly, I'm not you. I am a god called Mercurius. Well, I, I think that is, I think that is his truth self. Well, you can think it, but it's not in the story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. Mark, I relate to how naive the guy, the son is with the bottle. Yep. Just open that yep. sucker. Yep. I am doing good. Yep. Doing what I'm told. Boy, I remember that so well. I mean, I'm still that way. Yeah. Probably coming here was just like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think we, I agree with you. I don't think we ought to make a big deal about the father being such a, a failure of not getting the kids through college. As a matter of fact, the father respects the son because he says, son, if you don't come back, we can't make it. Yeah. He appeals to him. He doesn't order him. Yeah. He isn't an authoritarian. He says, we can't make it. And we have to respect the son. Yeah. Because the son has a sense of social interest. And he says, okay, I've got to give it up because I've got to go back and help the family. But once he expresses that sense of solidarity with the family, he, he, he's got this itch to go out on his own, right? Mm -hmm. And the father says... Cool it, man. I mean, let's take a nap. You don't have to be in a rush for every day, right? <laughs> That's right. I remember when I was growing up in the South, some older man would sit, uh, say, say to me, say, come here, come here, sit down here and look at this sunset. Now go get the fuck away from me. <laughs> what the hell? Like, I ain't got no time to watch those sunsets. <laughs> you know, silly sunset, but now, and that's what he was saying, come take a nap. Yeah. Come yeah, take right. a nap. Give it to us. Um, when I graduated from college, my dad came and got me and took me out west. First time I've ever been out west. And went to all these beautiful nature places. And, and so we couldn't connect. I didn't, it was awkward. I didn't know, I didn't know what, to, what I was getting. So I got Nancy. I said, look, Dad, I just graduated from college. i got to go back and get a job. So I flew back. Same story. I flew back, opened the, opened the bottle, got a job, laid down, and took my fucking neck. Whoa. Thank Is you. It? That's very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, I, I'm really connecting with the, the sun opening the bottle. It's it's that tenants that's impulsive. It's just to, to rip it open. And it, to me, it, it speaks of what you were talking about earlier, about the flying from uh, great father to great mother. It's like he left the father's side with the patriarchy, and he went to the mother's side, which is, you know, don't think, thing, don't think things through, don't stop, don't... You know, just sort of fall back into the river and let it happen. Well, that's what happened. You just ripped the, the cork out. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody, one, two. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I relate to that. Uh, I would have gone back to my father with a bottle and said, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And I really regret that I didn't open my own bottle because the wisdom my father had for me was be safe, be in the middle, be regular and be dead because that's how you can make it. Mm -hmm. So eventually I became an addict because that seemed like the only other way I could get it. The bottle opened up. Yeah. Whoa. Well, it's amazing how the story can be seen differently. Yeah, who else? Thank you. Yeah, I have the same regrets, and I didn't open the bottle because everybody's telling me it's too goddamn dangerous. And maybe it is dangerous, but if he, had no, if he didn't open the bottle, then you'd have a boring story and then go back to talking yeah. <laughs> Could I ask you, what was the bottle that you didn't open? What was that bottle? Um, just uh, to do the things that I wanted to do. Like what? 
like uh, instead of playing football, yes. playing the band. And yeah, right, right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, and right, and right. And right. I think I think the bottle has to be open. I mean, there's too much energy yeah. in that bottle. It cannot stay contained. The sun don't have a choice. I think the bottle with all that energy in it just has to open. Yeah. Yeah. There may have been a genie in the bottle. Yeah. It was a genie. Was a what genie. does the word genie mean? Genius. Where genie means genius. Genius. So your genius is in the bottle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yow. Mm. Yeah. I, I connected it to the uh, whining female voice, and I never could turn down the whining female voice. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did that pretty well, didn't he? <laughs> a little too well for my comfort. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, because I can't turn it down. It has to be open. <laughs> That's right, it has to be. Okay, yes, please. Um, what I'm relating to is, is tired, and I used to never be tired, and now I am getting tired four times, and I want to lay down and take a nap, and my son wants me to go with him to do something, and, and sometimes I don't have the energy to do that, and I think I feel a lot of shame over that. I'd like to be there with him when he opens the bottle, and then maybe both of us can figure it out. But, you know, in the story, that's what it was for me. It's like, I want to rest, and I want to be there, and I don't know how to do both of this. What do you think, uh, Martina? He doesn't have any obligation to go with his son everywhere, does he? No, not at all. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, you're going to find a bottle. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's not... This, the father knows he's going to find the bottle. And the father's been trying to keep him away from that bottle for years, which is why I sent him to college in the first place. <laughs> But then it's time comes when you have to get rid of it and let's bring him home and he's going to find a damn bottle. And the other thing that's very interesting that no one spoke about, it, maybe so, and I didn't hear it, but it's the idea of, uh, of being a, an obeying son. In other words, the child goes to college because dad says you got to go to college. So he goes to college. He comes home because dad says, well, it's time for you to help me cut wood. And then... Um, child kind of wanders off, chases women, which in mine is interesting when you're chasing bird. That's called chasing women. Are you following your bird? That's what we call it. So I thought of that when he said, and then you hear this voice. And the voice says, let me out of here. And he obeys. So he's obeyed his father this time, he obeyed his father this time, obeyed his father this time. A different voice comes and he obeys it That's without good. thinking, you see. And here we go with the neck breaking son of a gun. One little detail that I just want to come back to for just a moment because it's where I, I, I listen to. <clears throat> and he comes to a, not an ugly oak, but, a, but an angry oak tree. This is where he finds this bottle. It's in the angry oak tree. And what Martin was saying about how he's always obeyed. Now, I don't know about you, but in a certain way I was rebelling a lot. But in a lot of ways I was always obeying. Trying to anyway. And that creates a tremendous amount of anger that one has to face just prior to opening this bottle that lets something out. 